The two we've just looked at are fairly straightforward. One of them we have to do absolutely nothing about, the front controller. Uh, that's given to us as part of the JSF framework. The other one, the facade, well, that's dead easy. Uh, just one class that facilitates use of a subsystem. And our boundary classes that come out of the USDP approach will quite naturally fall into that. Less natural is the command design pattern. And here you'll notice a big explosion of classes in your application. The idea of the command design pattern is that it will encapsulate a user command as an object. This will then permit the issuing of commands without knowing about the request or its recipient. So a client that wants to make use of some feature within the application, instead of having all the command code built into the client, will simply, in a way that I'll explain in a few minutes, ask for a command. That command will come to it as an object and then call one method in that object. And the object, being the command, will then know how to perform all of the activities within that command. And one approach that we can use with this is to build a command for each of the use cases. And then when a request comes in, we work out which of those commands we want, in other words, which use case is about to be activated, and then that command will perform all the necessary actions for that use case. Now in our USDP boundary classes, what we could do is to rewrite all those methods that are in the interface class as commands. And then the UI class only has to instantiate a command and then execute its common method. And that way the UI class needs to know absolutely nothing about the user command and therefore the code within it. It just needs to instantiate it and execute it. The participants in the command design pattern will be the command, which is an interface. It will define a general interface that all concrete commands will implement. The concrete commands are the individual commands within the application. Now this introduces a very good software engineering concept, which is that we should program to interfaces, not to individual classes. So what we're doing now is saying there's going to be this concept called command, and that will have a number of methods. Those methods are defined in the interface. Then we can write as many concrete command classes as we want. We'll have one for get student. We'll have another one for register student for module, and so on. The lovely thing about that is that it makes our code extensible. We can add new commands without any great changes to the rest of the application. So if we decide, oh, I need another use case, all I've got to do is to write a new concrete command for that use case. And the rest of the application, because the rest of the application is based on the command interface, will be able to use that new concrete command class without any problem. We'll need a client, which is essentially the user of the commands. In this case, we're going to make the client a command factory. A factory, as I'll show you in a little bit, is a very useful design pattern. It's another design pattern, and its job is to simplify the creation of objects. Now when I say simplify, I'm talking about that from the point of view of the client, the user of the factory. It's a bit like you saying, I want to have a particular kitchen worktop. And you'll say to the factory, I want it made from this material, this thick, with these features, this bit of polishing, that bit of rounding, and so on. And then you wait for the factory to deliver the finished product. Well, that's what happens with these things here. In computing, factories are builders of objects. We tell the factory what we want, and the factory does all the hard work and returns the finished object to us. The UI class is going to be the invoker. This is the class that will actually execute a method in the concrete command. And then receiver, these are going to be the concrete commands in our example. We'll see those in a bit. Now you can find with all of these command, sorry, with all of these design patterns, you can find more information online, in books, and so on. So let's see how these design patterns can be used. We're going to look at three applications. One is just a basic example. We'll fly through that very quickly. 
Then we'll look at the same example, but having used the USDP to design it, but there won't be any command patterns in there. And then we'll extend that second example by making use of command patterns. Probably the easiest way of working out how these differ is to look at the class diagrams, and we'll do that in a moment. All three of them are exactly the same application from the, the viewpoint of the user. So they'll have an, an index view from which, if they want, they can click a button to add a customer, which will take them then into the view customer details after the customer has been added. Or they could go from index directly into view customer for the details of a particular customer. This is going to display a summary of customers. This is based on the sample database that comes with JavaDB that ships with NetBeans. Now in the basic example, you can see the three views, the three facelets, index, add customer, and view customer. Behind index and view customer, there's a managed bean called customer bean. For clarity, I've omitted all the attributes and methods. And you can see that the customer bean has a relationship, an association with customer DTO, and also has a dependency on discount DTO. When adding a customer, we're going to make use of another managed bean, the add customer bean. It has a dependency on both the customer DTO and the discount DTO. And up until now, this is the approach that we've been using. The managed beans have been interacting directly with the database. That shouldn't sit well with us. The idea of having all of that database interaction being duplicated in two of these classes so that we can use the same database, that really is screaming out for refactoring so that we have some class that holds all that commonality. One of the problems with this approach is that the managed beans include functionality for both view and model. They've got view functionality because as managed beans, their job is to accept information that comes in on an HTTP request. There are set methods for putting values into the properties and also for providing values for the next view. The get methods are used there. And also some action methods so that when a button on a view is clicked, those action methods will execute. That's all to do with the view. On the other hand, they've also got built into them model functionality. That is functionality that is all about working with the data that's in the system. And since we want to improve our applications to get a much cleaner separation of concerns so that there's a very clean separation between model and view, it would be very good for us to revisit these managed beans. Now using the USDP helps us to achieve that. In the next example, we can still see the three facelets with the same two managed beans, but we've now factored out of there the code that is to do with model and to some extent we've simplified them now so that they've only got the functionality that is absolutely necessary for interaction with the facelets. With the USDP we know that there's going to be a boundary class. In this example we're calling it user UI. We know that there's going to be some kind of manager class that will control or manage the entities within the application and those entities are going to be represented in these data transfer objects. By the way, DTO, data transfer object, is another design pattern and we've been using that already without really telling you about it. What we're going to do here is to make the user UI a facade. In the previous example, the customer bean was having to do all of this interaction. we would got built into that all the complexities of interacting with other bits of the application. We've now factored that out. So these customer bean and add customer bean, managed beans, now only have to interact with the facade that is the user UI class. You can see that we've used the stereotype to annotate this class to say, look, this is a facade. So I'm telling the reader of this design, I'm using a design pattern here. And anybody who knows what a facade design pattern does will immediately understand what's going on here and why it's being used. You can see also that the interaction with the database has now been taken away completely from the managed beans and put into the one manager class that we've got in this very simple application. And that's a good thing as well. We've only got one place to look whenever we want to 
modify or correct problems with the database interaction. Let's take a quick look at that in the code. You can see that the customer DTO implements serializable. That's quite important because in these kinds of applications, we need sometimes to write them to storage for whatever reason, or maybe the server will need to write them to storage. And for that to happen, they need to be serializable without anything other than implements serializable. That will enable these to be written uh, down data streams to be stored. It's a fairly simple bean, really. Uh, we've got these attributes. Notice that they're all private. We've also made them final, which means that they can't be changed after they have been initialized in the constructor method. We've got a constructor that will have these parameters for the values for those attributes. And then we've just got a load of get methods that return the values of those attributes. So the DTO is a very simple thing. It's essentially a class that represents an entity and is used for transferring data around the application. What will happen here is that the customer manager will consult the database, extract data, put that data into a DTO, and then pass the DTO to other parts of the application. And you'll notice down here the note that essentially all these classes have got some dependency on the DTO, but to prevent the diagram becoming overly cluttered and confusing, I've omitted those for now. The customer bean has, for example, an action method called fetch customer details. Whereas before, the fetch customer details method in the previous, the basic example, does all of this. This database interaction, all of that stuff, and stores a new customer DTO in one of its attributes. That's quite a lot of code to read through and to understand. And then a lot of that is duplicated when we want to get customer summaries and so on. Now, in the second example, fetch customer details is now two lines. It simply calls find customer by ID from the boundary class, the user UI class. That method returns a customer DTO, which is then stored in the attribute, and then we return the, the name of the next view. So much simpler. By refactoring, we've taken out all the complexity of that database interaction and left a very easy to read action method. In the boundary class, find customer by ID is simply going to call the find customer method that's in the manager. Again, this is a very simple method. It's made simple mostly because of the structure for the or the architecture for the application. If we now look in the find customer method, that's where the complexity is. That's the database interaction. But it's only database interaction. We haven't got any view code here at all. So we've really done a very good job now of separating out the view and the model functionality. We know that in here, we've only got database interaction. And so that's the one place to go if ever you want to look for database interaction. It will create a new customer DTO object using the database data as the parameters for the constructor. And then right at the end, it's going to return that object to where it was called from, which is the boundary class. And the boundary class is going to return that to where it was called from, which was the customer bean. So just by a simple chaining of methods, it will get the appropriate functionality and return the appropriate result. Now let's add in the command pattern. Most of these design patterns, when you're using the USDP, will not feature until you get to the class diagram. So with the USDP, you'll start off with your use cases and your activity diagrams, then your analysis model. From the analysis model, you will then derive a class diagram. That's your initial class diagram. Then you start to think about design patterns. And when you decide, oh, I want to use a facade, you either pick on one of the existing classes to become the facade, or you write an additional class that is the facade you want. So it might be that when using a facade, you have to add in an extra class. When it comes to the command pattern, when you decide, oh, I think a, a command pattern would be very useful here, you're going to have to add in quite a bit. Are you ready? You're going to add in 
a whole subsystem that is all about getting commands. You'll need a command factory. You'll need the interface for command. And you'll need as many concrete command classes as you have got commands, which generally, I would suggest, is one concrete command class per use case. Whereas we had five classes, suddenly we've got an additional five. And that's just for three commands. If you wanted to add another command, that's really quite straightforward because you will make a little change in the command factory and then you'll create a new concrete command class. That's it. The rest of your application will work as it did before. And so that illustrates, to some extent, the benefit of using a command pattern. Let's take a look in the code for this. Let's start off with the user command interface. You'll see that it's very simple. It defines one method, execute. When any other class wants to use a command, all it has to do is to create that command and then call execute. So that greatly simplifies the use of the commands. Let's take a look at an example. Get customer summaries. There's the execute method, and you'll see that it's going to do what was done in the managed beans in the basic example, and then what was done in the UI class in the second example. Find customer, that's the one that we were looking at previously. Again, an execute method that simply calls find customer in the customer manager class. So it's not doing anything very complicated, but what it has done is it's factored out of the user interface class, the code that relates to these commands. We'll look at that other class in a moment. We've got a constructor method for each of these concrete commands. And we pass in the necessary data for this command to do its job. When we're wanting to find a customer, we need a customer ID. So we will pass that customer ID to the constructor and it will be stored in this field up here. We'll also set up a new customer manager object so that later, when the client calls execute, we can call the find customer method from the customer manager, passing in the customer ID that came in as the parameter at time of construction. So that one command encapsulates all the code that is necessary for finding a customer. And now we've got one place to go to find all the code that relates to finding a customer. And we can see that it's going to call the find customer method, so we can go and have a look in there. And we see actually that is unchanged from the second example, which is what we'd expect. This is the benefit of separating responsibilities. In the previous example, we'd already taken out of the managed beans the database interaction and put it into one class. Now we've added some other classes, these command classes, and we haven't had to change the database interaction at all. By separating these responsibilities, we've isolated code so that each class will have one responsibility. And since that part of the application hasn't changed, then there's no need to change the customer manager class at all. We can just focus on these commands. Now the command factory is used to create command objects. It does that by making a choice based on some kind of code. What we're declaring here at the top are three class level constants. And essentially, we're setting up a code for each of the commands that could be requested. The value, as long as it is unique, is not important. That could be 101, 102, 103. It could be 1,001, 2,020, 3 million and 36. It really doesn't matter. What matters, really, in terms of readability, are the names. And so long as those values are unique, it doesn't matter what values they are. These names get customer summaries, find customer by ID, add customer. Those are related to the messages that are sent in your analysis model. We can use those all the way through the system to make our code much more readable. The user of the factory will call create command and pass in a command type, which is basically one of those three values. And then all we've got to do in here is to have a selection based on that command type. So in the case where command type is get customer summaries, we're going to return a new get customer summaries command. Sometimes we need a bit more than just the command type. So I've overloaded the create command method 
and have provided this version where we pass in the command type and an integer which is going to be customer ID. In that case, when the command type is find customer by ID, we're going to create a new instance of the find customer command, passing customer ID as the parameter, and return that object reference. And the third overloaded create command takes a command type and a customer DTO. This time, if the command type is add customer, then we will create an instance of the add customer command and pass the DTO as the parameter. Remember, all the, the processing of those values, that's done in the command. This factory's job is simply to say, I will create the appropriate command object based on the, the code that you passed to me. Now, it looks a bit of overkill at the moment. I've got three methods, each one with only one option in the switch statement. But let's think about, well, I want to delete a customer. That means I need another command. So I'll write a delete customer command class. And then in the factory, I will add another case to this one here, where we're passing in the customer ID as a parameter. And so when it would have the case find customer by, by ID, as it is now, and then another case, delete customer by ID, return new delete customer command. And that's all we have to change in the factory. Just keep extending the switch statement. And where is this used? In the managed beans, all I've done is to call from the user command factory the appropriate static method. Create command in this case, passing in one of those codes. Now those are class level constants, so we put the class name dot and then the constant name. That is going to return, that little bit there, is going to return something of type command. Remember, command is the interface, and it defines one method called execute. So in a way, I don't even know what kind of object I've just been given here, but I do know it's an, an object that implements the command interface, and therefore I can call the execute method. Without knowing what object I'm dealing with, the exact type of object I'm dealing with, I can create it using the factory and then call execute, and that will do whatever it needs. Now, in this case, I know that that execute is going to return an array list of customer DTOs, so I'm typecasting that return result, and then I'm processing it. Fetch customer details. Similarly, here's the create command, passing in the customer ID. I don't really know exactly what kind of object has come back to me, but I know it's of type command, and therefore I can call execute, and that will return a result which I'm hoping I can typecast, otherwise I'm going to get a problem. So when I'm testing, I better make sure I, I'm returning the right results. And that's it, really, in terms of the command pattern. We're isolating each little bit of code that's related to one use case in its own class, which is the command class. It's going to do all the control stuff. In fact, in this example, there isn't even a user interface class anymore. It's been replaced by the factory and all the different command classes. So that's why in this example, the managed beans are no longer talking to the user interface class. It's asking the, the factory, give me the appropriate object that will perform this command, and then I'll call execute. And that's it. This gives us high cohesion and low coupling. Low coupling means that there's very little dependency between one class and the rest of the application. These new commands can now be added without affecting very much of the rest of the application at all. And that's a, a great benefit when it comes to extending your application. You'll get a, uh, an opportunity to do that in the tutorial exercises. And by the time you've finished all of those exercises, you should then be able to describe the purposes of design patterns, describe front controller, facade, and command patterns, and also show how they are used in a JSF application.